Welcome to worship. This is the fifth Sunday of this beautiful season of Easter, and we are in the Gospel according to John, a beautiful passage where Jesus is comforting those whom he loves most. It's a story of self-giving, Jesus sharing his heart, his love as the way, the truth, and the life. He speaks to those early disciples and to us. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. We have this beautiful image of embodied love. The heart, the intention, the word, the love of God in the person of Jesus Christ leading us, gifting us with his presence and the power of his transforming love. Is there a more beautiful image for us on this Mother's Day weekend than embodied love? as we give thanks for the women who have poured their hearts and their lives into our own, we turn in worship to the source of this precious love. Welcome, welcome to worship. Please join with me in the opening prayer. Risen Christ, you prepare a place for us in the home of the mother and the father of us all. Draw us more deeply into yourself through scripture read and minds and hands opened so that when our hearts are troubled, we will know you more completely as the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. So we turn in the Gospel according to John in chapter 14. Jesus is speaking. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, 
there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. Praise, praise God for this, the living word. Thanks be to God. In the Gospel according to John, chapters 13 through 19 all take place on the very last night of Jesus' life, the night before his arrest and crucifixion. Jesus tries to explain to the disciples that he will be betrayed, that he is going away, and they can't bear it. They can't hear it. They're upset. They don't understand. And so Jesus speaks to them about going ahead and preparing a place for them in the spaciousness of God's heart. Jesus won't just show them the way. He tells them he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he offers this profoundly unique relationship with God. Jesus is not speaking about access to God or a way to, to be with God. He is offering the world a new relationship. A relationship with God as a loving parent. God the Father, the Father, Mother God, this all-caring, intimate God who knows us by name, who loves us and cares deeply for us. Philip catches this glimmer of hope and insists, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Show us the Father, Jesus, and that will be enough for us. Enough. It's a word I've been using a lot in the last days and weeks. Enough. The Hebrew word shalom is usually translated peace by Gentiles, but it embodies a much bigger, broader image. 
The word shalom embodies a state of tranquility that comes from peace, fulfillment, completeness. In other words, the sense of enough, one of the greatest gifts on this earth is the gift of shalom, of enough. But how many of us in these recent weeks have had spirits asking the question, are we enough? Am I enough? Are we doing enough as we try to care for children and homeschool them during this pandemic? Those of us who are working from home wonder, are we enough? Are we doing enough? And for all of the people out of work and facing unemployment and financial insecurity, profound questions of, will there be enough? Are we doing enough to stay safe? Are we doing enough to keep our loved ones safe and our neighbors? Are we enough? Probably, throughout human history, this sense of discontentment, this question, has driven a lot of what we have done. Does anyone really have enough? And perhaps at the core of that question is the bigger question of God. We know with Philip, with all certainty, that because of our loving God, then all of our meaning and purpose and identity and our future flow from the very character of God. This is what Philip knew and why he asked, Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. Jesus is the answer to the question of God. He looks deep into Philip's eyes and Philip's heart. Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Embodied love. In Jesus, we see a God who understands us. This God who from the beginning of all life, from one end of our Holy Scriptures on into our present day, a God who has tried to communicate with us, have a relationship with us through promises and prophets, God attempted to reach out and bring us back to God's full intention for us until in the fullness of time God entered into our lives, into human life in the form of Jesus. This man who grew up in a poor family who worked hard for his daily bread, who lived under an oppressive foreign government through Rome, Jesus knew his disciples' lives, their challenges, their hearts, their fears. And so we see in this gospel lesson for us today that just hours before his own arrest, Jesus is comforting them. He understood. He knew them. In the late 1980s, Gallaudet at University in Washington, D.C. Uh, made the news. Gallaudet is the nation's only institution of higher education that is dedicated to deaf and hard of hearing students. And in all of its history, each of the successive presidents have been hearing. But in 1988, the student body protested They named the disrespect they felt by the appointment of yet another president who was not deaf like his students, and the administration listened. The new president was Dr. Irving King Jordan, the first 
deaf president of Gallaudet University. Immediately after his appointment, he met with the chair of the board of trustees and the student body president. And when they came out of that meeting and were met by newspaper and television reporters, the students had tears in their eyes. There was no interpreter. <laughs> they had someone who knew them, understood them, and there was no need for an interpreter. So it is with us. In Jesus, we have a God who understands us, a God who speaks the language of our heart, who knows us. We are reminded that there is no emotion, no feeling, no experience that we will go through in our life that God didn't experience firsthand in the life of Jesus. Jesus was facing the final ordeal, not the disciples, yet he knew their fear and he comforted them. This is all just so astounding when we recollect the scene but it's one more powerful testimony to Jesus Christ that he is the Word made flesh, the incarnate Son, the embodied love of the Heavenly Father who came to us to reveal eternal things. And God's house is spacious. God's love is spacious. Jesus speaks of his father's house, the home of God, a place which he himself has prepared for each of us to live eternal life. In his father's house are many rooms, or, as many of us remember from the King James translation, in my father's house are many mansions. Both words are so appropriate. Rooms, mansions, the point is this, spaciousness, this ample, open, eternal dwelling place for God's faithful that's intended for us now, this present moment, a place that now deaths cannot erase, but as we move through death on into that fullness of life, the spaciousness continues. The psalm writer of the Old Testament, in Psalm 31, verse 8, speaks of God's rescuing work as setting his feet in a broad place. <laughs> Jesus builds on that image when speaking of God's love, God's intention, a space, a space ample for dwelling that has no end. And do you hear the personal concern of Christ for us. More important than the emphasis on the spaciousness, on the broad and capacious dwelling place that Christ has prepared, is the personal fellowship. I go to prepare a place for you, you specifically, and I will come again and bring you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. The scriptures tell us one thing clearly about our life in this eternalness of God's dwelling here and forever. We shall be there in the fellowship of the heart of God in Jesus Christ. And we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It points us all to this all-important connection with Jesus Christ. It's the person who makes the place, who gives us the courage and the confidence for entering that place. It all stands upon his personal, caring, redeeming love for us. This embodied love who knows your name. In our baptism, he makes his home with us. At the heart of our faith is this person-to-person -person bond. And in all of the ultimate matters of life and death and eternity, this is what eternal life is, belonging to him 
now and forever. This is the hope. This is the promise in which we live. This embodied love. The words of our Lord that summon us to hold fast to this power of hope in the present and with all of our hopes and dreams fulfilled in so great a measure that we don't have words to describe it. From the very beginning of creation, God had a plan to make us a part of his family forever. This embodied love, this profound sense that that Jesus had, that God was in him, and that it was God's love and God's words and intention, God's works through Jesus Christ, and so this promise that comes to us, that as we love and as we reach out, it is Christ in us. So every time we may ask, but am I enough? (laughs) Am I enough in my parenting? Am I enough in my most significant intimate relationships? Jesus calls us to remember that as we open our hearts and as we open our hands, to receive him, that we too will be this embodiment of his love working through us. Have you ever sat with someone following a crisis or someone who had a significant death and just prayed for the right words to say when there were no right words? But just your being present just your loving that other person and opening that space between you to the spaciousness of the eternal love of God through Christ in that moment. It hardly matters what words you used at all. The sense of sharing Christ's presence with one another. I felt it in a hospital room and at the time of someone's death they have shared with me that they felt the presence of a son or a daughter many states away. Embodied love. On this Mother's Day, for every mother, grandmother, and parent that asks if they're enough for their children, especially in these challenging times of everybody at home, your love, your desire for that child to be safe and to be well, is the embodiment of Christ's love, and that is the light that will show through. And it is my heartfelt prayer that every child on the planet, every single one, would have one person, one person, in whom they would see that there is a love that is real and a world that can be trusted. For any child living in poverty or violence or abuse, A prayer for one person, that grandparent or neighbor or teacher or somebody, to help make this truth real. Perhaps our prayer is the same as Philip's on this Mother's Day and on every day. Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. We continue to search for meaning and purpose in our life. But we know that we can find all things in knowing God who knows us. The God who speaks our language, who knows our hearts and our joys and our challenges. And as we see ourselves as sinful or broken or failing, God sees you through the eyes of Christ, as forgiven and whole. This profound gift of eternal life, wholeness, fullness of life, the redeeming power of love that in forgiveness frees us to love one another. Then we will see the Father, and we will know and say with great happiness, It is enough. Embodied love. Alleluia and Amen.
As God's beloved people, let us pray for the church, the whole human family, and God's good creation. God of life, in this Mother's Day, we pray for the women who are pregnant, those who are waiting with joyful expectation, and those who are filled with uncertainty and fear. We pray for women whose pregnancies are high risk and whose lives are in danger in the birth, birthing process. We also pray for women and men who long to be parents but who struggle with the infertility. Join their cries with those of Sarah and Abraham, Elizabeth and Zechariah, that your will may be done in their lives. Mother in God, we pray for women who are mothers, either by birth, by adoption, or through foster care. We pray that they may be supported in their mothering task by the men and the other women in their lives. That their children may be provided with sufficient food, shelter, and health care. We pray for women who have lost children, either in utero, through sickness, through war and violence, or through tragic accident. Comfort them with the, your everlasting presence and assure them of new life. Mothering Spirit, we pray for women who are incarcerated, who have been abusive and hurtful and neglectful, and those who give of themselves not just through childbearing, but with their intellect, their skills, their gifts, and their physical abilities. Bless all women that they may receive equal compensation for their work, may be protected from abuse and harassment, and may be valued as unique individuals. Holy Jesus, we pray for those who are transitioning, those who are seeking to understand who God has created them to be in their bodies, minds, and spirits. May they be protected from danger during their time of vulnerability and guided by those who love and support them. We also pray for women who strive to protect and advocate for those most vulnerable, children, the poor, God's creation, the disenfranchised, other women, and those men and women whose voices go unheard. Comforting spirit. We pray for those for whom this is a day for, of mourning and sadness. For those who have lost mothers and other important women in their lives, that they might be comforted with the peace that passes all understanding. Holy God, we 
give thanks for women who have been our mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, daughters, like partners and friends. We give thanks for men who have mothered us with their own caring affection, nurturing, and friendship. We lift to you now the names of those who have mirrored your mothering spirit. Give them your grace and bless them in their lives. Holy God, we lift our prayers to you through the Holy Spirit in hope, in trusting all for whom we pray to your great goodness and mercy, made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now as our Savior, Jesus Christ, has taught us, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. a loved tradition here at Cargill Church that on the second weekend in May we take a special offering for Golden Cross Sunday. This special offering supports the health and welfare ministries of the United Methodist Church across the state of Wisconsin. Each year the Health and Welfare Committee allocates the funds received based on the greatest needs and this year's special offering will support Harbor House Crisis Shelters, Northcott Neighborhood House, United Methodist Children's Services, and United Methodist Hospitals Ministry. For those of us feeling called to participate in this offering, uh, please identify your gift as you mail it into the church office as Golden Cross. And a special word of thank you to all who participated in the virtual Crop Hunger Walk on April 26th. Cargill United Methodist Church was represented by five walkers and additionally by three volunteers. Thanks to your generosity, our goal of raising $9,000 was exceeded as we raised $9,765. A big part of this was raised by Deb Klein Tollefson, who worked very hard this year and raised $7,700. We, we wish a special to extend our heartfelt thank you to um, Mrs. Shireman as well uh, for her leadership for us. We now have a preliminary Janesville area crop hunger walk total of over $32,000. This is embodied love as these funds all go towards hunger and uh, hunger and feeding programs internationally and 
to echo right here in Janesville as the need increases during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for your faithful generosity. the heart of our Lord as he speaks to us. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these. Know that you carry with you all of the love of God all of the peace of Christ and the encouragement, 
the empowerment of the Holy Spirit through every trial and in all rejoicing. Alleluia and Amen.